Hey folks, I'm Tina Hui from Follow Coin, and we're here at Bitco headquarters in Palo Alto. This is Ariana Simpson. Please Hi. introduce yourself. Yep, so I'm Ariana Simpson, as Tina mentioned, and um, this is Bitco. <laughs> So what is BitGo? Yeah, so uh, BitGo is basically a uh, security platform for enterprise. So we basically um, pioneered the first commercial multi-sig wallet. And um, at this point, we serve a number of industry um, industries, so various companies in the Bitcoin space and outside of it. So anything from exchanges to wallets to um, institutions that want to hold and transact super securely in Bitcoin. So multi-sig is a term that's being thrown around the Bitcoin ecosystem and I guess maybe if you could shed some light into what multi-sig is, what the differences are between say BitGo and other multi-sig offerings. Yeah. Sure, yeah so um, basically the, the premise for multi-sig is that traditional Bitcoin addresses have a single key. And what that means is that you have one point of failure in the event anything goes wrong. So whether that means that you know your account gets hacked or you have um, your you accidentally throw out your hardware with your private key stored on it, any sort of issue like that basically means that your coins are lost and cannot be recovered, which is obviously not an ideal situation. No. Um, so multisig was designed as a way to solve this problem and it allows for the creation of multiple keys. And in order to transact um, from a, an address that you know has uh, that, an, a multisig address, you would basically need a subset of the total number of keys. So the way BitGo's model works is we do a two of three key model and essentially um, one of those keys is generated and stored securely on BitGo servers and that's the key that we use to co-sign transactions. Um, the user holds two of the keys. One key is operational and that's basically the key that they use when they go to make a transaction. Um, and the third key is basically kept as a backup key and that might be used in the event something is wrong with any of the other keys or to basically recover the wallet. Um, and yeah, that's that's basically how our model is built. That's really great. Um, so what is BitGo D and you know, all of these different core products that you guys offer? Yeah, so uh, we just released BitGo D last week and um, I think the, the benefit of that is really that um, you know, a lot of existing systems, exchanges, things like that were built using Bitcoin D, which is the original Bitcoin client. And after, um, after these systems were built using that, obviously there's a pretty high switching cost to transitioning over to a multi-sig offering. And so what we did is we basically built a, a drop-in replacement, which will continue to use Bitcoin D for all of its functionality, minus wallet functionality. So um, exchanges or, or companies that have an existing system can therefore transition over to using multisig very, very easily. Oh, it's interesting. I didn't realize it was minus the wallet functionality. Yeah, so the, the functionality um, that Bitcoin D has is replaced by BitGo D's um, insofar as it allows for multi-sig wallets to be created. Yeah. So that's great that it's minus a wallet. Does BitGo offer wallets? Yeah, yeah. So wallets are obviously uh, a core part of what we offer. Um, all our wallets are HD and um, they are multi-signature wallets. So what is HD wallet? What is that? Sure. Um, so HD stands for hierarchical deterministic and it's not the same HD as your television. Um, and basically what that means is, um, well, it's really about financial privacy. So the blockchain is a public ledger and what that means is that for better or for worse, all the transactions are out in the open. Generally, people think that's for better. However, there are certain situations in which you might not want everybody to have access to your financial data or be able to tell who owns a certain Bitcoin address. So basically, um, let's say I am a company that pays its employees in Bitcoin and every second Friday of the month, I spend to all of my employees' addresses. Um, any one employee knows the address from which they're receiving funds. So if they were to look at the blockchain, they might actually be able to infer, you know, which addresses belong to their coworkers, how much their coworkers make, and all that type of information. Um, similarly, if you're a hedge fund, you um, 
perhaps don't want the entire world to know that you're holding a large amount of Bitcoin or whatnot. And so um, this is basically all data that is probably best kept private. Right. And obviously it doesn't have to be in any way illegitimate or illegal, but it's just not something that needs to be in the public domain. So that's basically the premise for HD wallets and uh, how they work technically at a very high level is basically um, you have a single seed and from that seed you're able to generate an infinite number of Bitcoin addresses which are not visibly linked on the blockchain but are again derived from the same um, seed and therefore can be contained in the same wallet without being um, linked on the blockchain. Oh, that's great because, you know, you want it to be, I mean, Bitcoin is great. It's being applauded for decentralization and anonymity mm -hmm. because still track back a lot of the, you know, if you are really good at coding or you just figure out how to hack it a little bit, you could figure out who the owners of the wallets are and where it went, right? After exactly. a certain amount of, you know, I guess, investigation. But who wants that? Right, exactly. And, you know, you wouldn't, publish your bank account information online so you similarly don't want to publish um, all your Bitcoin transaction information or your wallet balances online either. Well, how many, uh, you know, how many bags of potato chips are you buying with your Bitcoin anyway? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't, don't need that information to be public. Right. So what is BitgoD? The original Bitcoin client was called, is called Bitcoin D and essentially a, a number of exchanges, wallets, things like that were built using that. Um, the difficulty in terms of using multi-sig sometimes is that it's a fairly high switching cost and BitGoD was basically designed to um, help ease that transition so um, you can continue to have most of the, the, well all of the functionality of Bitcoin D but at the same time adding in wallet functionality um, including multi-sig that comes from our version of that which is BitGoD. That's fantastic. I mean, I think it's good because security is going to be one of those big driving forces of Bitcoin. And even with cash or any kind of money um, out there right now, even if it's commodity or currency, it's important to have security. And you guys are leading industry standards for security. So, Anya, can you tell us about what you think the state of Bitcoin security is at now and in the future? Like, what's exciting? Sure. Um, so, I think you know, there's been a huge amount of discussion around multisig and all of that. In 2014, Gavin Andreessen said it was going to be the year of multisig, and we obviously think that that should be the case. Um, however, if you look at um, some statistics, it's not exactly true yet. So, still less than 8% of all Bitcoins are held in um, multisig addresses. And obviously we think that number should be a lot higher, ideally like close to 100%. <laughs> um, and I think that having uh, multisig be not just um, a, a plus, but more just a, a baseline of standard security is going to be really important. Um, ultimately, we'd love for everybody to be using Bitco, of course, but most importantly, we want the ecosystem to be really secure because if companies, institutions don't feel safe holding and transacting in Bitcoin, it's going to be really difficult for the industry to scale and for Bitcoin to reach its total you know, global potential. So we want to make sure that, um, that security best practices are being created and followed across the board. And um, you know, hopefully we see a lot more of that in the coming months. I agree. I mean, 8% is a pretty bleak statistic. I mean, you would really want it to be 50% at least next year, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's great growth. We've seen, I think it was, it was something like 1% um, at the beginning of the year oh. and then ended up going to 8, which is, you know, substantial. This year? 8x in 2014. Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's still not enough, not even close. And so we want to encourage everybody to be using multi-sig addresses. Um, it's just, it just makes sense. Definitely. Actually, interestingly enough, it is probably becoming kind of like an internet uh, protocol and industry layer because everyone's getting hacked, you know, Home Depot, Bank of America, like all these, Bank of America is getting hacked and asking customers to change their credit card out. I mean, I, that's happened to me, you know, I've had a whole new number. This is a pain point for, I think, the entire... I would even say money industry, if you think about just money as an industry. Forget yeah. Bitcoin, it's all related. And so it's kind of interesting whenever you think about it, like, hey, two-factor is a thing. You know, security is important. Um, don't you want to be doing things right? 
It's, it's fascinating. Absolutely. I mean, in 2014, there were almost 700 uh, security data breaches. And it's funny because, um, you know, at least in Bitcoin, personal information is not attached to a transaction. But at the same time, if funds are lost, they're not retrievable in most situations. So ultimately, security is really important. And, um, you know, even uh, security is important across the board. Um, you know, just a couple, maybe two weeks ago, um, a number of major banks were hacked and had hundreds of millions of dollars stolen. And so um, you can't, it's not something that you can ignore. Unfortunately, people have a tendency to say, oh yeah, we'll worry about security. You know, it's Act fine, it's, it's, good, it's good enough, right? But um, it's really not. And so what ends up happening is you have these issues and um, we want to prevent those because obviously they're, they're not doing anybody very much good. Prevention is better than uh, defense. Right? Yeah, you, you don't want to, you want to uh, certainly prevent it rather than cure it. Right. But well, thank you for your time. Um, it was really great catching up. Yeah, Always. thanks so much, Tina. Yeah, we're going to have you on the show more. Awesome. Yes. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, Bye guys. guys.